Hello everybody and welcome to Toy Tutor U Curator's Corner episode number 17. My name's Sean Brosnan, I'm a curator at Toy Tutor Otago Settlers Museum here in Dunedin and I've been making this series of stories about Pioneer Dunedin uh, for the interest of our museum visitors who maybe can't visit the museum. Now most of my stories have focused on notable characters, you know, the well-to-do, the well-connected in Pioneer Dunedin, but today I want to focus on someone from the lower ranks of society, a more ordinary sort of character who nonetheless made a big impact on the lives of his fellow working class settlers. The story begins with the arrival of the Philip Lang on the 15th of April 1848, when Captain Cargill, in welcoming the newly arrived immigrants, made a great speech where he set out his vision of what Otago could become. He extolled the virtues of the site around the harbour. More practically though, he also announced the wage rates that would be on offer from the New Zealand company organising the settlement for all the public works that they might organise in Dunedin. Now that was probably the most important part of the speech for the ordinary working men on the ship and their families because they were going to depend on work from the New Zealand company and they weren't altogether thrilled with the wage rates they announced. Uh, three shillings for the unskilled and five shillings for tradesmen. Now we don't need to worry too much about what those values might equate to in modern terms. What we need to remember though is that the working men in coming out here had hoped to do better than they could back home in Scotland and England, yet the wage rates were pretty much the same as at home. And they soon discovered that the cost of basic goods here in Otago were way higher than at home, so they really they felt they weren't better off at all. But the real kicker was the hours of work that he announced. On the voyage out, the Reverend Thomas Burns had promised passengers on that ship that in Otago, eight-hour days would be the norm. Captain Cargill on the John Wycliffe, on the other hand, and now here in Dunedin, he had insisted that it would be a 10-hour working day in Otago. Now, those two extra hours were really crucial to the lives of the working-class settlers. They needed to earn a wage, and so they had to go out and earn a living working for the New Zealand Company, principally here in Dunedin. But then after work, they had to go back and build their own houses, develop their own gardens, and look after their families. So losing two hours like that was going to be absolutely crucial so grumbling about the wage rates, and more especially the hours of work, simmered away in the background in Dunedin throughout the first year of settlement. Thomas Burns, meanwhile, was true to his word. He proved to be the largest employer of private labour in Dunedin, and he paid the full whack and for an eight-hour day. But the crunch point came in January of 1849, when with the New Zealand Company suffering, you know, reverses, not going so well, Captain Cargill announced a reduction in the wage rate for unskilled labourers, and an extension to the working week. Not just 55 hours a week, they've been working on Saturday mornings as well, but now 60 hours a week, having to work the whole of Saturday. Well, you can imagine how that went down. The change of policy coincided with a visit to Dunedin from the New Zealand Company's chief agent in New Zealand, William Fox, based in Wellington. And he, of course, backed Captain Cargill's new policy. But the working men now had a champion of their own. This was Samuel Shaw, a painter and plumber from London who had come out on the John Wycliffe with Cargill, um, as it happens, and now he gathered together all the workers, skilled and unskilled, and together they presented a petition to William Fox begging for a change in the policy. And when he refused that and rebuffed their approach, they had a mass meeting at which they demanded an eight-hour day in Otago. Now, if you've watched the last couple of episodes uh, with Captain Cargill as the principal figure in each of them, you'll understand how he would go off the handle at such a revolt from below by the workers. Even worse, when the only newspaper in the colony at that point, uh, in, in the settlement here in Dunedin, the Otago News, took the side of the workers and began to agitate on their behalf, he was infuriated. Cargill also determined to drive Shaw out of Otago. A cockney spouter, he called him. Shaw, meanwhile, pointed out that an ill behove Captain Cargo on his very generous salary of £500 a year to lecture Otago's working men about their wages and conditions. When Cargo referred in repost to the workers as drones, it stirred their resentment even further. They stuck together. And with Burns still paying the higher rate and accepting an eight-hour day, and the newly arrived and very wealthy William Valpy, who we've talked about in previous episodes as well, also offering the full wage rate and an eight-hour day, Cargo's position was doomed. For once in his life, he had to accept defeat. According to Dr. Hawkins' chronology of Otago events, the eight-hour working day system was established in Otago on the 21st of February, 1849. Now, that makes Sam Shaw a significant figure in Otago and New Zealand history. 
but unfortunately we have no photograph of him and very little is known about his life. This cartoon by James Brown though shows some of the pioneer working men getting desperate for food and going to Thomas Burns for help and sure would have looked something like them. And he does crisscross too with another of our earlier stories. Back in episode 7, I talked about the first hotels in Dunedin and referred to Tom Watson, who ran the commercial and, and who drowned in the harbour in October 1849. Now he, before he was a hotel keeper, had been a carpenter, also from uh, London, from Kent. I've got a strong feeling that he and Sam Shaw were mates here in Dunedin. In any case, after Watson drowned, Shaw very quickly moved into the hotel and within two months, he had married Watson's widow, Isabella Mole. Sam Shaw remained a thorn in Captain Cargill's side in the years that followed. He stood for every election too, first for the Dunedin Town Board, which was the precursor to the Dunedin City Council, and also for the Otago Provincial Council. But he never won a post, and in every succeeding poll he seems to have sunk lower and lower with the number of votes that he got. But that never stopped him having a say. At every public meeting, he'd stand up and say his piece. And you'd have to say, reading some of the reports of those in the Otago Witness, that perhaps you have some sympathy with Captain Cargill because he does seem to have been a bit of a stirrer. Now, references to Shaw in the newspaper can be found right up to January of 1860, but then he just disappears and we have no idea as to his subsequent fate. But next time you clock off work and head away to spend your evening doing something else, something you want to do, spare a thought for Samuel Shaw, who won that right for Otago's working men way back in 1849.